Today on Locked On Red Wings, we do a crossover season preview with the boys at Locked On Ottawa Senators. Your Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, we now welcome a pair of very special guests. We are beginning the division preview portion of the offseason, and we're very happy to be joined by Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley of Locked On Red Wings. And this is the perfect way to begin the division series because these two teams are compared and contrasted more than I think any other two in the entire National Hockey League. But first, let's introduce the fellas. We'll start with you, Brian. How are you, sir? Doing great. Uh, I'm really excited to do this crossover because, like you said, this is the two teams in this division that are probably compared to each other the most, and they're like they're pretty much lockstep in their rebuilds in every facet. I mean, down to the salary cap, they're fifth and sixth in the most cap space available, separated by like fifty thousand dollars. It's incredible how close these two teams in are in terms of the rebuild. So I'm really excited to get into that and talk about uh you know why the red wings are gonna be better but you know we'll get there when we get there okay we'll get there i guess for the detroit uh, red wings fans and listeners we'll introduce pilsy as well say what up for the listeners so they can hear your beautiful voice hey guys yeah definitely excited to do this crossover because uh there's gonna be some contentious games i seem to remember ottawa kind of getting the best of detroit at the end of the season i lost so, my hat uh, we'll see yeah yeah the hats are uh, are off for the Sens fans when they were in detroit that's for sure but it's a whole new season so we're excited to, to chat with you guys about it 100 percent. i needed a bit of a rebuttal after brian's little shot there <laughs> scotty how are you buddy we've chatted before obviously you've been a long time host locked on red wings locked on tigers how are you today sir i'm doing well man it's good to be back yeah the uh definitely you know a lot of people especially in the second half last year got the better of the detroit red wings yes. so uh <laughs> you know i think i think hopefully this is a new year with new opportunities but uh but yeah i i'd say we had like this stretch where I want to say in, in a month period, we gave up like three or four hat tricks to all the people who had never had hat tricks before. It's not ridiculous. <laughs> it, was, it was really impressive. So new year though, new year, new That's team. In, impressive is a, a word you could describe it. I, I'd say a little bit more embarrassing, but yeah. I'd say <laughs> impressive. <laughs> Good well, spin. what was impressive was the start that the Red Wings had. I mean, 4-2-1, yeah, oh and one, sure, sample size is, is kind of at play there, too. But still, seven wins in their first 12 games of the season. Did you see the cliff? Or after that five-game win streak in early December, did it just kind of take everyone by surprise? I mean, we always knew what the team's problems were. And the chief problem was defense. They had no defensive depth outside of Moritz Sider. I mean, Moritz Sider came in, immediately played the most minutes at 20, 20 years old when he came in, played the most minutes on the team, played on every special team, and was the number one defenseman and was expected to be the number one defenseman from the moment he entered the National Hockey League. Now, he was phenomenal, won the Calder Trophy, but that's incredibly unfair expectations to put on a 20-year-old coming into the league. He owned it, but he was the only defenseman on that roster capable of it. I mean, you were pairing him with Danny DeKaiser, who, God bless his soul, I mean, he was dealing a lot of injuries down the, the stretch there, but was not even, barely even a bottom pair defenseman skill or uh, play style-wise at that point, play-wise. So, yeah, you could definitely see the cliff coming, but that has also to be fair and call myself out. I did start to buy into the hype a little bit because they were – outperforming teams that at the time we were thinking were some of the best in the league. Obviously, Golden Knights missed the playoffs, but they beat the Golden Knights. They beat the Edmonton Oilers at home. Uh, they beat the Washington Capitals in overtime. So, yeah, I began to believe in the hype, but when you looked at the team and you looked at the paper or the roster on paper and you just knew, you're like, okay, but when's the other shoe going to drop? And eventually it, it, it didn't just drop. It fell through the floor. <laughs> it, well, I, I mean, it was, it was also like very much uh... – even going on a on a bigger scale than just the first 12 games of the season, like it really was a first half, second half thing in, in the sense of the defensive implosion that happened. Like it really went from like we're, we're competitive in every game in the first half and, you know, we're around like a 500 team. Like there was a point where Boston had uh, what, like four or five games in hand on us, but we were only like, 
three or five points. Maybe it was closer to six or seven points back from Boston. And everybody was like, oh, like, you know, if, if Boston doesn't win very many of those games in hand, like maybe something can happen. And then the second half started and post all-star break was literally one of the worst like defensive performances from a team I've maybe ever seen in my life. And it was just consistent six plus goals against the game. And like, that's not an exaggeration. <laughs> like it was really, really bad. And um, so, yeah, it, it was a very steep cliff and one that came very quickly, but uh, I'm not sure. I, I think both can be true. I'm not sure everybody expected to like maintain where we were at in the first half, but I also don't think anyone expected the, cliff to be as steep as it ended up being either yeah pilsy get this stats guy ross over here the All detroit right. red wings allowed seven or more goals 10 different times last season yeah, yeah. and and i would venture that all, like a majority of those were in the second half of the season yeah yeah only two were in 2021 so that's there you go point there. <laughs> yeah wow and twice double digits and once was to the the Leafs. That was an exciting game though. If that I remember. was the craziest yeah, was hockey wild. game I've maybe ever seen in my life. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would say our experience with the Leafs might've been better down five, one with That's two true. minutes left in the second period. That's it was true. Five, one. And then <laughs> we know how that one ended. Anything to get the Leafs. I mean, they got the better of you guys there, but uh, before we move on, I do want to, you brought up more each cider and there's a lot of back and forth between Sens and Red Wings fans, right? It's There's so much that you can chirp about and, and get on, but then we all come together for the, sake of, <laughs> for the sake of Mannheim, our German sons. You guys have Moritz Sider. We got Tim Stutzla, yes. the two buddies. I think that'll bring us together here as, as the years go on. And boys, before we get back to chirping, World Cup of Hockey, Team Germany, how we feeling? We feeling good about that? That's, that's looking real good. I mean, those are two guys who are bona fide NHL, like not just all-star caliber players, but you could make the argument are going to be elite level talent in the NHL at such a young age already. I know Stutzla had, uh, what, 50 point, 53 points this season? Think, right? 58 points, thank you. Yeah, 35, 35 in his last 35, point per game yeah. player down the stretch. Which all was right. fantastic, and then obviously we all know what more Sider did. He had over 50 points this past season. I think he was 11th among all defensemen in the league. Uh, 11th or 19th, I'm getting confused because there was just that uh, uh, recent NHL network poll that put him at 11th among all defensemen, but I think it was 19th among all defensemen in points already as a rookie, which doesn't seem that impressive, but when you remember he's a rookie, is incredible. And this is a guy coming over from Europe who wasn't even touted for his offensive production. He was touted as a big defensive defenseman. And then he goes out there and is doing things on the offensive blue line with incredible patience, making NHL veterans look foolish. And then the defensive end going after Sidney Crosby, yeah. like making a point to go after and intimidate Sidney Crosby. I mean, these two guys, you put them on the same team, team Germany is not just for that team, but, the future of the game for Germany, you see that on your television, you go, you look and see how competitive team Germany is going to be against, you know, the Scandinavian powerhouses in Finland and Sweden. And then of course, you know, USA and Canada, anything can happen. Although Canada, you know, always a juggernaut, you, you are growing the game and these guys are so incredibly good for the game. So absolutely. I mean, brothers in arms when it comes to talking about our German songs. <laughs> All right. Yeah. We got to shout it. Obviously our, our buddy over at locked on Oilers, Brett Holden, they've obviously, they've got the King daddy topper yes. of team Germany mm-hmm. there with Leon dry And don't be surprised if JJ Paterka is in this conversation going forward. That's enough of that though. Back to the Red Wings. I want to talk about how the Red Wings finished the season. Then we're going to get into the off season additions for both teams. We're going to finish off discussing what the projection is like, for next year because there seems like there could be a wild card spot available, but we'll get into all that a little bit more. Was it a case boys? I know we talked about the defense. We talked about how they, they just surrendered too much at the end of the day, but when it rains, it pours. Cause I'm, I'm looking here and there's a couple extremely long losing streaks here. Mm-hmm. How can a new coach coming in and a guy who's had success? Uh, I'm blanking on the name. You guys can help me out, but from Tampa, the assistant Tampa's coach assistant, there? Derek Lalonde. Derek yes. Lalonde, thank you. First time coach. Like, what is it that's first on his to do list among Red Wings fans to straighten things out? I mean, I think the biggest thing we we had a conversation uh, kind of a little bit last week about this too, and I and I think one of the biggest things is special teams is like a huge thing for me personally. I know, like, that's just something that the the penalty kill and, and the power play both have been so bad for years now that it's something that has to be addressed immediately. But 
I, I also think there are so many players in the last couple of years that I, I think a lot of people expected maybe more development out of. I mean, like Zadina just got extended. Like that's a big one, right? So like he's easily the most controversial player on this team and, and is just like free clicks and views whenever you say his name. But yeah. it's, that's why it's, I made a short about him. <laughs> right? But it's, it, it's crazy because, you know, he, he obviously hasn't live, lived up to, to the hype and expectation. So I think people are going to look at special teams. People are going to look at players like Zadina. But at the end of the day, uh, I, I think people just really want a, a big step in the right direction with with the win total. And, and this is a, a team and, and, you know, looking at the whole landscape of the entire city, an entire sports town that is just so desperate for any winner that I, I think people just want, even if it's not like postseason or anything right away, I, I think people just want like a significant step in the right direction at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to agree with Scotty on most of those things. It, it's just... When it rains, it pours is definitely a very true sentiment when you're talking about those long losing streaks. Obviously, the defense was a huge thing, but it was it was everyone. I mean, there were key injuries. Lucas, you find out that Dylan Larkin was injured after the All-Star break and eventually had a season yeah. shut down. Um, his production took a dip. Lucas Raymond finally, you know, found his level. Uh, so he slowed down. But I just, when it comes to talking about the Detroit Red Wings, I think the new voice in the locker room is going to have a huge effect because Jeff Blaschel's, message clearly got stale for the Detroit Red Wings in the locker room. And they all just needed a hard reset. We were talking about as soon as the season ended, we were like, are we before the season even ended? We we're like, when do we fire this guy? Not that we didn't, you know, not trying to chase a guy out of town or anything, but it was just realistic. It needed to happen. And I think Derek Lalonde, everything he said, the focus on the special teams, especially is going to be huge. So I'm really excited to see what Derek Lalonde can do, but, it's hard to tell what he will be able to do because he lacks that head coaching experience, but because of his pedigree, because of the fact that Steve Eisman chose him, I'm really excited that this is going to be the guy for the Red Wings. All right. Welcome back to the crossover between locked on senators, locked on Red Wings. You can follow us all on Twitter. I believe it's L O underscore Red Wings fellas. Yes, yes sir. On yes. Twitter. Perfect. We're at send central, the YouTube page, super easy. Just type in, Locked on, and they'll pop up right away. The fellas have been doing great work over there on Locked On Red Wings. You can also make another Locked On show your second listen of the day. We appreciate all the support heading in to what is season four of the Locked On's NHL channel. We're fired up about that. And we came on the Locked On NHL channel when Ottawa was in the same year as what you were talking about, where they had a head coach, but he just seemed like he was a lame duck. And at some point, it just wasn't going to work out. So Ottawa ultimately made the decision to can Guy Boucher. Mark Crawford is is just like a, a filler for the end of the year. But then you get another new NHL coach, DJ Smith being a first-time guy. What do you guys have? I'm sure you've been asked about the Senators so much. What are some of the questions that you have when it comes to whether it's last year's Senators or how the the optimism, like what's caused this, this level of optimism that we think we're going to be in the hunt for a playoff spot? Well, not so much the playoffs. I mean, there are a lot about the playoffs, but I do want to kind of circle back to you talking about Stutzla. Him as well. The fact that Lucas Stutzler Raymond. Stutzler Raymond. Answer yes. it right now. <laughs> yes. Because yeah. It's a great debate. Same draft class. Uh, this past year, they put up very similar numbers. I think just one point to, apart from one another. Obviously, Stutzla finished very hot. But these two guys, we're talking, we, we know you like to joke about the brothers in arms between Sider and Stutzla, but when you're talking about positional players playing near the same position, both wingers, and playing on I, – I did now, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know what line Stutzla played on, um, but Lucas Raymond played top-line minutes. Yeah. When you're comparing these two guys, do you, what do you see in these two guys that's making them – making you think, oh, Stutzla's the better player or Raymond's the better player because Corey Pronman of The Athletic just put out his numbers and Stutzla is eight and Raymond is nine. So. Lafreniere is 10. We're brothers in arms. <laughs> <laughs> brothers we'll, in arms we'll, we'll, we'll ask Corey that. We're having Corey on tomorrow. So we'll yeah. uh, we'll have to ask him about Definitely. that. Pilsy, do you want to take this one? I will just say, though, and I'm sure Pilsy will build off it. Stutzla made the, the change to center in the middle of last season. More so out of need when yes. the Michigan native Josh Norris went down with injury. And all of a sudden, it just opened up everything for him. 
Yeah, so he pretty much transitioned to a second line center um, when Norris came back. When they were both there, he was the second line center. And I think where you can see the similarities is both of their hockey IQ and they're both just able to make dynamic plays. Like Tim Stutzla, we always talk about it last season, his line mates were not the caliber of line mates you put with a guy who you draft third overall and who you're hoping is going to be a future part of your top six. Like he was playing with guys that were third line players and the Senators didn't have many better options. That's, that's what it we, came we would always joke. And I'm sure you're the same way where it's like, we've got three third lines pretty much, but now we've got yeah. this future superstar. We like to refer that, make sure you put the umlaut on, on superstar. Yes, but uh, that actually reminds me, Nolan that made a sick graphic for me when he signed and had that, but that's neither here nor there. Pilsy, when you talk about line mates and upgrades, I think this is where the excitement comes in with Tim Stutzla for next year. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the kind of consensus is the Sens are going to keep their top line the same. It's going to be Brady Kachuk, Josh Norris, Drake Batherson. that, trio was just incredible the chemistry was amazing they're all similar age groups they're going to dominate together so keep that together now what pretty much everyone thinks is going to happen with the second line is you're going to have tim stutzla at center alex de as one of his wingers 40 plus goal scorer there's a nice uh, no, line. no big deal yeah there's a nice line made for you timmy and throw in claude Giroux, a savvy vet that can still get it done and the big thing with Claude Giroux being on that line is he can help out Timmy with the faceoffs. As, as you guys know, young centermen in the league, they typically struggle with faceoffs. It takes time. So Claude can take the faceoff. Timmy can play center once the play gets going. And then you got a 40 plus goal scorer on your other flank there. So I think having Timmy be fully comfortable as a centerman for the better half of a second NHL season, having him, like Ross said, be a point per game guy at that position and now upgrading his line mates to be proper caliber. He's poised for a breakout season. And I think this is really where we're going to see the Stutzla Raymond debate really flourish here. And maybe uh, Scott, I'll throw it to you. You can, you can kind of compare this. How will Lucas's Raymond, Lucas Raymond's line mates change or how will they stack up? versus where Timmy's going to be at. I mean, so uh, presuming that he's staying at the top line because he didn't really do anything to deserve to get moved off of that. I mean, obviously he'll be playing with Larkin again, and, and Larkin had one of the best years uh, of his entire career, if not the best year of his career this past season before the uh, before the injury. And then on the other side, uh, on the other wing, I, I guess Bertuzzi would probably be like the, the presumed, but – um, like Bert got moved down to second line to kind of spread out the production a little bit at times last year, and they have made a ton of depth moves. So that might not be a, a, a permanent thing either way. But regardless, like if that is it and Bert is at the top line, that's a, you know, a grinder that's going to make wreak havoc in front of the net. And, and, and that line was really productive when it was still intact. The, the only reason they moved Bert off of it was because they wanted any other line to score <laughs> goals right so like they, they just felt like they had to but um so so now with depth maybe you can move Burt back up to the top line and uh you know assuming Larkin continues doing what he did last year he was nearly a point of game player for a majority of the season before the injury started nagging um and, and then Burt just being the, the the kind of type of player that he is I I really think Raymond could be in a situation where that that hot start he got off to could be something that that he could more or less maintain, and I think that's the expectation more this season. Um, really, I, I mean, the the biggest thing as well is the biggest thing this team addressed this off season was defense, whether it was forward defense or like defenseman defense, like just all around. It was so unbelievably bad last year that. Um, that is something that, A, we'll be looking for Raymond to take a step forward in as well. But, B, I mean, like good defense leads to good offense, you know. And and, and so just having, I don't know, not being down three goals halfway through the game or every seven. time you're you're going yeah. out on the ice has got to be got to be worth a little bit. And, and having, you know, a little more faith in, in, in who's behind you for positioning and all that. Like there's there's a lot that I think. I think he could take a really big step as well just in year two. But um, I, I think the biggest thing – I don't know if, Brian, you have anything to add, but I think the biggest thing is just trying to get him to to maintain what he got off to last year rather than kind of a, a roller coaster, hot stretch, cold stretch type of season. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, start of the season, he was just a phenomenal – Every his hockey IQ was just – he was on fire at the yeah. start of the season, making all the right plays all over the ice. And as the season went on, as happens to rookies – 
the season started to catch up with him. The NHL started to catch up with him. And so offensively, I don't think he has much else to prove. I think, you know, he's just going to get old, another year older, another year better if a sophomore slump doesn't catch him. But defensively is where I really want him to start to flourish. If you look at his advanced metrics, he wasn't a positive impact in the defensive zone um, by the end of the season. And that's just something that I'm not worried about. I think it's going to come with time, especially with a new regime that actually knows how to coach defense coming in. But that's a, I don't need to get into the, the, I don't need to get in the mud arguing about the defensive (laughs) scheme that the last coaching regime regime uh, had, but yeah, I'm really excited. Yeah. Well, our, our old coach used to call it the system where it was just like a one, three, one, and you just sat back. It was like, I did that. uh, I did that. Imagine, uh, yeah, imagine (laughs) neutering Eric Carlson in his prime and being like, yeah, just uh, tap it off the glass and out. Like, I mean, it worked for a season, but then everybody's expecting it. It's like, okay, we, we know the system key. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We we just did the, we, we called it the, uh, the, the play not to lose where we yes. just oh, all yeah. dump offs, just park the bus and just yeah. don't really have any pressure at all. Would, yeah. would you have guessed that if you play not to lose, you end up losing a lot of those games <laughs> or you don't end up winning? Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned something that I want to build off of there and that's the defensive metrics. Timmy's are not good, yeah. not good at all. But I think that's the case for a lot of senators last year. Uh, it seemed to be like, uh, like outside of Connor Brown, who it was moved more so in a budget move, I think you obviously you brought in Claude Giroux, and it was kind of funny because when they they brought in Claude, and, and he's an Ottawa guy, he, he grew up here from I think the age of eight onward, played junior here. Like he, he's just an awesome, he's gonna be an awesome ambassador, not only player, and he can still play 65 points last year. Like he's still a dynamic player and will really help Timmy. I want to say Giroux's like top five in faceoffs over the last yeah. decade. So oh, to, do you to remember build this video? Point, does anyone remember the video? I forgot who who it was against, but it was like six or seven years ago, maybe now. There was this that video that went viral of somebody. I want to say it was someone on the stars got all up in in Drew's grill up during a face off. Oh yeah, Steve Ott. Up. Was yeah, it? Steve oh, yeah. Right, yeah. Right, wow. And he's like, and he's like, I'm gonna win this face off. He's like, I'm top five, whatever. And Claude just goes, okay, okay, and then he really wins the face off. <laughs> One of my yeah. favorite hockey clips ever, man. Oh, dude, there's actually oh. a good one of, of Giroux also mic'd up. I think it was like on the road to the Winter Classic, so they had them mic'd up quite a bit. But uh, And he and James Van Riemsdyk are obviously buddies from their time with the Flyers. Yeah. But JVR is with the Leafs, and all you hear is Giroux go, you pigeon. And then he goes, <laughs> oh, cool, oh, cool, and starts making the noise in his face. And then another one where he's like, hey, Phil, you have a Coke today yet? And he's just there having a go. good time. So he's That's obviously so uh, a good chirper as well. But Giroux is going to bring so much in terms of like stability to this group. Because again, I think he's going to help improve all their defensive metrics just by being out there and, and being a guy who can, you know, just go through the battles. He's been through the battles before, uh, been to a Stanley Cup final, although probably the rest of the Sens were in elementary school. It's such a young team when, yep. when he did back in 2010. Um, but another thing, and, and I guess the final thing, and we can move off of this point, but it is a great conversation to have between Lucas Raymond and, and Tim Stutzla. Is, um, and I, I asked Mark Mathot this last last week, former senator. We, um, I, I just, I, I said, can, so one, if you look at Alex DeBrinkett's highlight reel last year, God, your, your first takeaway is Patrick Kane is so good. Mm-hmm. Like uh, so many of the highlights and he scored 41 goals. I'm not taking away anything from Alex to a great finisher. And he did this in junior too. He put up ridiculous numbers and everyone's like, yeah, well his center is Connor McDavid. What do you expect? Then the next year McDavid was gone and, and he scored, I think 61 and 65. Yeah. So he's good on his own, but you look at that highlight reel and you're like, okay, Patrick Kane is ridiculous. That to say now, a player who I think has similar dynamic ability as Patrick Kane and Timmy. I'm wondering if in practice you can be like, Hey, like when Kane does, when Kane sees this, he does this. I'm, I was wondering if that can kind of be taught. He method who played 600 NHL games told me I was being a bit of a fanboy with that statement. So <laughs> I'll have to rely on him, but I, I could see it being like, Hey, the X's and O's help. It can't hurt. He's obviously going to learn a bit more playing with those two guys rather than Alex Formanton, who had, I think, five NHL games before that, and Connor Brown, who's been stapled to a middle six role his whole career. So, I mean, anyway. Ross, we, 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 at our core, we obviously try to be professionals and try to be as unbiased as possible, but at our core, yeah. we're fans. So I think being a little fanboyish at times is good. I, I was just we're, thinking this the entire time. Yeah. We, were, we were talking, like, don't tell our listeners this. I'll, I'll cut this out of our episode, yeah, Scotty. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. We won't cut it out. 
Um, I'm actually really excited for your guys this season because, yeah, and I know it stinks because we're directly competing with the Ottawa Senators. The Red Wings are not us, but the Red Wings are directly competing with the Ottawa Senators for um, hopefully a wild card spot. But you just look at the roster that's compiled on this team, the young talent that's compiled on this team, the savvy moves that Dorian has made this past offseason, and the fact that you guys finally rebranded your uniforms back to the yeah, 2D logo good, eh? to have one of For the real. cleanest uniforms in the league. For real. It's, so uh, it's just so so gorgeous. I mean, the Senators are one of the most exciting young upcoming teams in the NHL, and obviously I believe that about the Red Wings as well, but this is it, it, this is pumped. For this has sure. to be pumped. It, it, Ross also, is so excited he had to leave the room. <laughs> can't, even, can't even continue. He couldn't handle it. Dude, I was uh, like, you good? <laughs> you also never have to um, – you're never going to get – No, like imagine around. having this for oh, there a, it a is. Decade. Oh, there it is. There it is. is. <laughs> I was like, did Ross for have to use the bathroom? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Too bad you don't have a, a <laughs> SNES jersey, Ross. That's even no, worse. That, that one I just refuse to buy. The, uh, I, I was saying you, you guys never have to worry about Brian or I spewing like pro Patrick Kane propaganda. So like you can just say whatever you want about Patrick Kane. And that's fine. We're not going to be like, oh, no, he's too good. No, yeah. Yeah. you're fine, man. Yeah, no, that's that's perfect. Um, yeah, no, I mean, the Red Wings obviously have one of the cleanest jerseys in the league. I, I, I had those in the background for so long, Brian, to make sure none was a Daniel Alfredson jersey. I was going to make you take it down. I, <laughs> I will say, though, so. I was so pumped the day Alfredson signed with the Red Wings because should have been not me. Well, I mean, Shepherd's pie and four shots of Jameson for lunch. I don't know if you want to get into why he left. We all know why he left, but uh, <laughs> we don't have to go down that, that, that track. Um, but Daniel Alfredson is just, he was an obviously a Senator's legend and arguably a Hall hockey of Hall of Famer. Arguably. He is a Hall of Famer. No, 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 no. He is a Hall of Famer. Listen, okay. Hall of Famer. If We're Alfredson's not arguing a Hall of that. Famer, <laughs> I will agree as long as. Henrik Zetterberg's a Hall of Famer because that's no, what no. I mean, if about you go the- to Toronto. His his photos on the building, like he's yeah. he's in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there now. But my point being is like he just the leadership he was going to bring to the Red Wings, and even at his age, I knew he was going to be so very good. And then he ended up mm-hmm. leading the Red Wings in points that season because Henrik Zetterberg got injured that year. Yeah. So he became kind of the pseudo captain to the Red Wings and led them to the playoffs where they ultimately got bounced very early because that Red Wings team was not very good. Yeah. They One were of my on favorite decline, stats but is so happy to have them. all of his playoff points are still with Ottawa. <laughs> nice, <laughs> but, nice. But I do actually bring that up, what you mentioned there. He is one of the only, has to be one of the only players in NHL history. And sure, you can put an asterisk that the Sens were still kind of an expansion team when he made his debut. He led his team in scoring as a rookie and in his final year at 40 years old. Wow. That in itself is super impressive. Yeah, That's crazy. Dude. I yeah. remember Scotty and I, when he got inducted in the Hall of Fame, Scotty and I got into a heated debate. Not a heated debate. We were I know, agreeing. I but it's just, I don't want to get into the whole Hall of Fame thing because that's more of a Red Wings thing. But if, if Alf- Alfredson is a Hall of Famer, and he deserves to be, and we agree on that. But if Alfredson is, Henrik Zetterberg is. And the fact that Henrik Zetterberg is not in the Hall of Fame yet upsets me. And I, Alfredson has the uh, better point totals. He has the better games played. But when you come to acc- accolades, man, Henrik Zetterberg's right up there with him, and it's just—I—I yeah. I know we will get in eventually, but I'm just like, come on, man! Get but he's older too. Alfie had to wait. I think yeah. Zetterberg, this was his first time eligible, right? Correct. Yeah, yep. It was. You're right. You're right. Yeah, he'll yeah. get in. Yeah. I mean, you should honestly be more upset that the Sedins decided to have twins because there was no way one was getting in before the other, even That's though everyone knows that Henrik was better than Daniel. Well, uh, and now you're getting whatever. these stories coming out that they were switching jerseys during games, and no, <laughs> <laughs> that story was crazy. To so read. whose points crazy. are really whose? It's just oh like, man. <laughs> Hey, another uniting moment. Brian Murray needs to be in the Hall of Fame. I know he coached the Red Wings for a little bit, but he's a legend of the game too. And unfortunately, didn't get his flowers while he was still uh, living. But that's a guy. David Poyle, I tried to get him on the show to – I just went through the Hall of Fame, like, who decides? And I was like, uh, well, he gave this guy his start, and he wouldn't come on the show. So you know what? We'll have to uh, let that simmer down. But again, a guy who's very well-deserved. I actually agree with you, though. Zetterberg, he's got the cup. He's got the two-way acumen. Got a constant life. uh, I, there you go. I just don't mind him waiting his turn a little bit. Yeah, more. that's fine. I know we'll get in eventually. I was I was very, being very. We talk yeah. about being fanboy. I was being very fanboy <laughs> in that moment. Absolutely, yeah. I own up to it. Um, I do. I definitely want to ask you guys about the whole playoff thing before we 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 yeah, get this hundred percent. That's the biggest crazy, argument, man. Yeah, it's crazy amazing. Division. So why don't we build this off of the bet online uh, totals Beauty. that came out? Because obviously our friends at Bet Online, we we love them. BetOnline.ag, but they put those out. And I'm gonna actually pull them up here 
Um, we tweeted them out at Send Central today. Perfect. So they've got Toronto at 107.5, Florida at 105.5. My my hammer lock of the century is they're getting under 105 points. I still think playoffs is probably more or less wrapped up for, for them just with their offensive talent. And who knows whether Spencer Knight's going to come in and, and become mm-hmm. the dude this year. But if we look beyond that, like Boston at 95.5 points, then Ottawa at 86.5, Detroit at 84.5. Like the, the projection is right there. And sometimes you can be like, it's a projection, dude. Like who cares? Like when they had Montreal at 78 in their projection last year over under, and they got 50 points all season. But with Ottawa, they set theirs at 73 and a half last year, and they got 73. So sometimes they get close. Uh, Brian, start with you. What is your thoughts on, on the way that Bet Online has the Atlantic Division shaping up? Honestly, it's it's a really tough tell. The fan in me wants me to be like, oh, Detroit will finish above Ottawa, but I, this is realistic. I could see this being how it play, plays out, pans out in the end, because both these teams have not just like on paper, but just talent wise, depth wise, have really acquired some great pieces this offseason. Obviously, yep. Ottawa getting a 40 goal score in Alex Debrinkit and Claude okay. Giroux being great. I mean, I think the biggest question mark with the Ottawa Senators still is their goaltending. You upgraded over Matt Murray, but Cam Talbot, you know, how big of an upgrade is that for you guys? Uh, that remains to be the question. But offensively, you guys have been are going to be great. I, I wouldn't be surprised if you guys get the over, but I wouldn't expect it to be that much. I think those are pretty good numbers for Ottawa, but it's so tough. I mean, Detroit and Ottawa being within two points of each other on this is so realistic. I, know, I, right? I could see the problem is with the Red Wings is this is such a radically different roster than what we saw last yeah. season that new on coach, paper, new, like, yeah, yeah, new head coach, everything's brand new. It's mm-hmm. not the same Red Wings team from last year. So on paper, you look at this team, you go, oh, this is a team that should be radically better, just so much better, but we don't know until the first game's played. I want to say They'll be hit the over and they'll be better than Ottawa and finish what I thought. I think during our prediction, Scotty, I was saying if they finish fifth and yep. competed for a wild card, that is a realistic goal to shoot for on the best yep. case scenario. Worst case scenario, I think finishing below Ottawa is right there. But I, if they finish seventh or eighth in the division, I think that's a failure on mm-hmm. this first season, first season with Derek Lalonde. I think they want to be fighting for that fifth spot. Maybe. Everyone always talks about Boston Bruins, too. I know we're not talking about the Boston Bruins, but everyone keeps talking about the Boston Bruins, and this is finally going to be the year they finally fall apart. But they just don't. I mean, Patrice Bergeron is an ageless wonder. The guy mm-hmm. does not get worse or bad as he ages. So I do expect Boston to be right in there in the mix. But, I mean, outside the top three, I think it is going to be Boston, Ottawa, and Detroit fighting for that four, five, and six spot. And I, I could see a situation where both teams hit the over. But I could also see a situation where both teams maybe don't perform what we were expecting because especially, again, with the Red Wings being a radically different team, you know, maybe they don't perform or gel the way we thought they would on paper. You know what I mean? So I I don't want to sit on the fence here, but I think the Red Wings can definitely hit the over. I think the Ottawa Senators can definitely hit the over. But it's just they're good numbers. I don't think it's a guarantee one way or the other. I would say bet over on both of them, though. Yeah, I just want I just want to quickly say on the Bruins standpoint, I think the under is is pretty pretty clear for me based on the fact that McAvoy and Marshan are out for the first three yes. months of the season. Yep. That's, That's a great huge. Point. That's time. huge. Scott, your thoughts? Special. Yeah, I'll be honest with you. I think one of my most confident unders is Montreal. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be straight up with you. <laughs> under I'm, the I'm last nice. place team, I love, love it. it. I'm feeling really good about under 70 for Montreal. I'm gonna up for the Habs. I'm gonna be honest, but I mean, it's it is so just like on brand based on the, the comments that like Brian and I get on a weekly basis about like Ottawa, Detroit, Ottawa, Detroit, and I, I'm sure you guys have have similar experiences, and it, sure. it's just it makes so much sense that they're right there and you know within two points of each other, and I I, I think. There's a lot of a lot of both of our successes within the division are are obviously going to be tied to how much of the under Boston ends up hitting with that 95, right? Like that's obviously that's 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 massive. And and when you're talking about you know if if, if Ottawa hits the over, you you know you, whatever you you get into the mid 80s, the high 80s, whatever. If if unless Boston is is below 90 like it's not even gonna matter in the terms of and the terms of being in the top half of the division right so it's i I think that that really is a a huge part of both of our 
end of season like relevancy is just going to come down to where Boston's at. But it, it, it's, I mean, we spent the whole show comparing and contrasting. Like it really is such a fascinating conversation that uh, I'm sure we could do another hour on. And and it's yeah. it's, uh, I I can't wait. Honestly, I I really I can't wait for hockey period. But I can't wait to to see. This is like some of the most excited I've been for an entire division. Yeah, like yeah. really, maybe ever. Like I, I'm so pumped to see how how it ends up shaping out. And uh, you know, despite what what our fan base says, like I am actually rooting for Ottawa. Like I'm I'm with it. No, same hundred percent. Likewise, I almost feel like we should do a monthly check in with, uh, <laughs> real, with the fellas all season long. Maybe throw throw a couple built bars on the line here. Get something. <laughs> hey, there get you something go. For it. Last thing I want to bring up, and we won't go too long with this, although I'm sure we all have our opinions. One of the biggest head-to-head we talk about Stutzlin and Raymond how about the two big dogs on the back end coming in this year Jake Sanderson for Ottawa Seaman Edvinson in Detroit let's start with Edvinson Scotty what kind of impact do you expect him to have right away well that's the big debate right so so la- at this time last year everybody the, the big conversation was what's going to happen with Lucas Raymond and everybody was like is Raymond going to make the team out of camp what's going to be the the vibe, like, is somebody have to get hurt for him to make it up? Is he going to start in the A and then be up really early? And, and this year, that is that copy paste exact same conversation with Edvinson. And uh, there's certainly no guarantee either way right now. But like Raymond ended up not only making the team out of camp, but getting put on like first line and had a Hattie really early on in his career. You know, like that My was, first episode, right? That right? Yeah, exactly. So that was a uh, clearly a a very the, the correct decision, but a, but a very impactful decision right away. And, and I think Edvinson, man, like I, a, we all can't wait. Like he's such a, like a, a unicorn in the same way that cider is with like the size and skating ability and speed and everything. Like he, he's going to be so much fun to watch. And, and I, I trust this front office like more than pretty much anything in my life. So if, if they want to s- start him down in the A and and bring him up, you know, a month or two into the season or whatnot, like I'll, I'll be fine with it. But I think that the realistically he could be by the midway point in the season, like the solidified second pair defenseman. Uh, and it, it could be that by game 40 for all we know, even if he doesn't start off the season, on the NHL roster, I think that's a really feasible um, option and and path. And and I I know everybody can't wait for him. So yeah, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be really fun. It's gonna be really fun because this defense very much needs as much depth and help as it can get. Pilsy, yeah, I mean, that sounds familiar, eh? Yeah, it's almost identical uh, to us, Scotty. Because in Ottawa, still the weakest part is the defense core here, and. Like, you guys have Cider as your anchor. In Ottawa, it's Thomas Shabbat. The veterans they brought in have not worked. Similar to you, you guys understand that. It just hasn't worked. They need a top four defenseman. Jake Sanderson is coming in this season. But the thing with Jake Sanderson is he had a tumultuous year last year. He went to World Juniors. He went to the Olympics. He got injured multiple times. He re-injured his injury. It's been a crazy year. We're hoping he's going to be ready and good to go this season. But the question is, sure, you can put him in a top four role, but who is his partner going to be? Because a lot of people want his partner to be Artem Zub. Artem Zub is the type of defenseman. He makes all his partners better. But if you're putting Artem Zub with Jake Sanderson, that means Zub won't be playing with Shabbat. And now your top pair is going to suffer because there's no one that can play at that level with Thomas Shabbat. So the interesting thing will will be to see is can Sanderson find the right partner that can help him transition into the NHL? And how many minutes are they going to put on this guy? Like Sanderson is used to being the top dog for all the teams he plays for, playing 20 to 25 minutes. You can't just jump into the NHL as a young defenseman to play those big minutes. But... The Senators don't have a lot of other options. So it's going to be very interesting to see what kind of role they give him and how he's going to be able to hold up in the first couple games here. Yeah, only played 23 games last year in college, and he got sliced. He was like dying. This is just the way he plays, like full out every every single second he's on the ice. He dove to the far post to try to stop a wraparound while his goalie was far the other way, and a guy came in and accidentally stepped on his hand. So sliced his hand right open. And then as he tried to come back, gripping the stick, reopened it, had to get surgery. So he had surgery twice on this same hand. 
But in those 23 games he played last year at college and NCHC, one of the toughest uh, conferences uh, with the University of North Dakota, 26 points as a defenseman. So able to generate offense. Everyone knows how great of a skater he is, but that part of his game, Ottawa needs so badly. So it's going to be really interesting there. Like, do you ex- Who do you expect Edmonton to play with next season? I mean, that's the constant debate. So I think everyone's dream is for him to end up playing top pair minutes with more cider down the line, one on the right side, one on the left side, because yeah, they're both not giant next guys. Year, though. Exactly. I mean, I think that's just a dream because Morris Sider himself is still very inexperienced in his own right. I mean, I think because of the style that Edvinson plays, being a, he's much more defensive. You're not going to get the offensive upside you get with Morris Sider and Simon Edvinson. Uh, but he's very smart defensively. I mean, I think you want to put him with a guy who's got some experience in the NHL, but also complements his play style. And we talk about Phil Peronic as a guy you could possibly pair with him. Now, Phil Peronic kind of had a bad season last year. No way of you know, putting it kindly. He just did not play up to his potential. But he's a little bit more of an offensive-style defenseman, and those two play styles could complement each other very nicely. And if it's not uh, Horonic and Edmonton together, you know, you put Olimata out there, because Olimata, I think, granted, though, being a left-handed defenseman, you don't really want two lefties on the same line, but Olimata is very safe. So if you want to put him with somebody who will allow Edmondson to make mistakes and cover up his mistakes, Olimata would be a great guy as well. So it's really depending on what you want out of Edvinson in year one. Do you want him to provide support for a guy like Kronik who wants to score goals, or do you want to watch him and make sure he's being tutored and playing, you know, uh, honing his game as a defensive style defenseman by putting him up with a guy who will protect him and guide him as well. So I think those are two uh, very possible options, but you know, uh, we talked too about uh, Ben Sherrod as well. Ben Sherrod would be another guy, a guy that just signed out of uh, Florida and uh, we not saw a lot of contract. him. We not saw, loving that we, contract. We saw <laughs> a lot of him in the Canadian division last year when he was playing in Montreal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it could be it could be really any three. I'd want to put him with somebody with a little bit more experience. So I think more more than likely you end up with a, a Philipronic or a, a Ben Sherratt. But you know, it's just it's going to be really tough because I think coming in, Simon Edmondson has the potential to be immediately your second best defenseman on the team. And how are you going to put him with a guy who's going to make him? you know, better when he's already better than everyone except for Moritz Sider. <laughs> Fair. I am. Oh, I just found it. Fellas from December 17th to December 31st, the Sens and Red Wings play three times. Here we go. In the span Let's go of two baby. weeks, three times in the span of two weeks, but we got to do this uh, beforehand. We got to check in maybe at the end of November, get mm-hmm. the boys, maybe 20 games under their belt. Beauty. So some of your listeners are probably looking at the first 20 games. If they saw what Ottawa has done the last two years, four wins in their first 20 games, each of the last two seasons, yeah. all but taking them out of playoff contention. So we'll touch base at the 20 game mark, but before we wrap up this episode, we need some official predictions in or out. Are the Detroit Red Wings going to make the playoffs? Are the Ottawa Senators going to make the playoffs? Brian, lead us off. Oh, no. Oh, this is a tough one. So you're asking if one or the other or both will be in or out? Each. Answer one and then the other. Man, this is a tough one. I'm I'm struggling very hard with my own biases. But if I'm being completely honest, I, I don't think the Red Wings are going to make the playoffs this year. Because if they're going to compete for a playoff spot, they're going to be competing not only with the Atlantic Division, but the Metropolitan Division Mm -hmm. for one of those two wild card positions. And I think with the Senators, with the Bruins, with the Blue Jackets, all those teams are going to be highly competitive for those wild card spots. I don't see the Red Wings making it. I could see, however, the Senators making the playoffs. But there's still big question marks, obviously, with your guy, like you guys said, defense, goaltending. But the amount of offensive production you're going to get out of the guys you brought in and the steps forward you're going to take, I could see the Senators snagging one of those two wild card spots, but it's going to be a really tough race down the stretch. Billsy? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll I'll try to hold my biases in, but uh, I've got Ottawa just barely making the playoffs. I think they're going to snag that last wild card spot. Yes. There's issues on the on the defensive end, but you got two solid veteran goalies who I think are going to be a great tandem in the regular season. And I think Ottawa is going to outscore a lot of their problems. Those additions that came in are really going to boost the goal scoring. They're going to have two competent power play units like 
they're going to be a force to be reckoned with offensively. And I think that's going to give them the edge and that's going to help them make the playoffs. I think Detroit is going to be right where you guys talked about. They're going to be fighting for a wild card spot. They're going to be playing in meaningful games later on, but I don't think they quite have enough to boost or kick one of those teams out of a spot. That's where I'll go here. Scotty. Uh, I, I think I'm going to go with a unique answer to that. I, I think I'll take no on both. And I, and I think I'll, I'll, Put it in, in the terms of uh, I it would not surprise me if neither of these teams make the playoffs that you're talking about like two of the best teams in hockey to miss the postseason like you're talking about like seed 17 and 18 right like I, mm -hmm. I think that that's very feasible and and I think that like I, I hate just saying like oh next year because we've been here like both of our fan bases and franchises I've like heard that for so long now but I really think that, um, like next year for for at least the Wings for sure is like the year that I think everybody expects the huge step of like, hey, you're you're it's you're supposed to go deep into you're, the postseason. Yeah, at this you're point, not or just at least make the postseason at this point. So, um, I, I think I'll go with with no for both. But I think you're you're going to be talking about two of the youngest teams in hockey that just barely missed the postseason and are really excited about the following year. Nice. Yeah, I, I'm. I probably lean towards no on both. I think that Ottawa's probably a year ahead of of Detroit. And I was gonna say because Ottawa had the the early pick one year earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. That wasn't the case. It's just Philip Sedina still hasn't broken out. Whereas yeah. the guy who went two picks earlier is the captain of of the Ottawa Senators, thirty goal scorer now in, in Brady in Kachuk. Yeah, yeah, leading the team in points. I think the last two years Brady's led them yeah. in points, and it's just wild to think he's going into his fifth NHL season right now. A guy who just like got drafted and. He's just that pro guy. So I think that Ottawa is probably a year ahead in, in that standpoint. But, man, I love what Detroit's done in terms of really setting themselves up for the future. Obviously, I'm, I'm based in Winnipeg. Gotten to see a bit of Andrew Kopp the last year. I think he's kind of that stabilizing force, a guy who can play all three, four positions. And I love what they've done. Like you said, the Chirac contract probably – you know, take a mulligan on that. But at the same time, this is kind of like Ottawa got roasted for going out and trading a third round pick for Travis Hamannick. And say what you want about Hamannick, bottom pair guy at this stage in his career. But the reason Dorian did that, he said, with one year left on his deal beyond the trade deadline when they acquired him last year, he didn't like what was on the free agent market. So he said, why don't I just get my guy now and, and get him acclimated? He played 19 games. I actually played a lot better than people would have given him credit for. So I think that that was kind of where Stevie Y kind of got caught with his hand with his cards open and he's like well now i need a defenseman did he have to give the term no but Sherrod, i mean that's free some agency teams think right he's good right and something teams think he's good florida gave up a first round pick to get him yeah. so you and know that's what thing I we talk about all the time with ben Sherrod too and I, I know we gotta wrap things up i'll keep it real short but you know teams in the nhl value him they clearly do yeah and so clearly all of us are wondering what it is but you know if Steve Eiserman is willing to pay this guy this much money to be a Red Wing, uh, he's done enough and has enough carte blanche cachet to give him the benefit of the doubt. He still deserves the benefit of the doubt because he hasn't done anything up until this point to prove he doesn't deserve it. Right. I guess the counterpoint to that is Erica Branson got $16 million this summer <laughs> as well. <laughs> <laughs> And he's a stud. He's just not a stud on the ice. He's just a good looking dude. Good Ottawa boy. Uh, no, no. But all that to say, I think it's going to be an awesome year between these two teams. I love that it's three games in two weeks. Like that is, yeah, that's, that's money. Because they had the two games in two weeks or in a week last season. Yeah. But three. And that was fun for us. That was very fun was. for us. And you imagine. mentioned Alex Dabrinkit, another Michigan boy. So there's some connections. Ottawa's got Austin Watson. Uh, Josh Norris and Alex Debrinkit, three three good oh, Michigan yeah. boys. So uh, fired up. And if you count the U.S. program that's based in Michigan, pretty much the rest of the team. Ottawa loves yeah, going yeah. Uh, going to the U.S. program. But Scotty, Brian, Pilsy, love the conversation. This was great. And let's uh, let's circle doing this at the end of October, end of November, around that uh, st stage of the season, and we'll uh, see how either bad or or on track our predictions are. Uh, Brian, we'll start with you. Any final words? <laughs> Go Red Wings. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Scotty? We ball, baby. Yes, sir. Felsy? 
I'll throw a go sense go in the chat here. That's how we're ending things off. <laughs> All right, everyone, make sure you're subscribed on YouTube, Locked on Red Wings, Locked on Senators, on Twitter, LO underscore Red Wings, and Send Central. Have a great day, everyone, and enjoy what will be a wild ride in the Atlantic Division.